In 2009, I wrote a poem. I mean, actually, at first it was a song, but it was my true life story, or at least part of it. And, and actually, okay, I guess mostly it was my true life story, which I'll come back to. And also, <laughs> I actually only found out I was a poet in 2009. Like, I didn't even know that. I mean, I, I knew I was a musician, but I guess it kind of just happened. Like, words just started spilling out of me that year, and I didn't even know where these words were coming from, you know? But suddenly it was like poem after poem after poem, and I literally, I just couldn't stop. And, and I mean, honestly, and it's kind of weird, but this is the truth, and anybody who knows me well will back me up on this, that up until that point in my life, you know, I had never even really read a poem, let alone written one, but there they were, these words. Like, it was like my heart was just like beating outside of my body in this new, different kind of way, you know, at least for me. And so, anyway, I feel like this particular poem was my most honest and intimate one. It, it even evolved into a play. Like, it's a long story, and I'm a long story. I mean, okay, hopefully with a long way to go, <laughs> but anyway, it was about my birth mother, how I felt at that time. I was adopted. I mean, obviously that's why I said birth mother. I mean, if you're not adopted or if you haven't spent time in foster care, you know, you don't say birth mother, you just say mother. So anyway, back to the story. I even performed that poem at the famous New Eurekan Poets Cafe that year. Yeah. Make some noise for Rob. Yeah. What's up, everybody? I even won a few slams with it, and, and as the story evolved into a theater piece, I wound up performing that play all over the world for six years, having these like incredible experiences meeting and connecting with all these beautiful people in all these faraway places, these incredible opportunities to, to share my story, like I said, all over the world. I mean, it was amazing. It was just, it was fantastic. And so fast forward to 2019, 10 years later, I find out some stuff that has me rewriting that story now. Because when I first wrote that poem back then, I had to actually make a lot of it up because at that time, and for my entire life, by the way, there were a lot of things about, again, my life that I wasn't allowed to know about by law. I mean, like, how crazy is that? Like, I wasn't allowed to know about me, okay? And so, anyway, here I am, it's 2020, rewriting my own story again but with more information this time about me that i didn't know before like this is my story as of right now this immediate moment and and after all of this and given the way my life has gone up until now i mean who knows what tomorrow might bring i don't know but at least for right now this is me and if there's one thing i've learned over my pretty long lifetime is that right now is all that really matters. Like, right now is the thing. And so it's 2020, the year of COVID-19, and the craziest and perhaps most volatile time of all of our collective lives. I mean, I, I feel pretty comfortable saying that, right? And so here I am, with you, sharing my story right now.
So you called me recently, said you wanted to meet, that you would treat me, that finally you felt like you needed to see me. That you would have called sooner, but you kind of wanted to feel free from feeling guilty. And so in my mind, this lifelong curiosity could finally have an ending. These feelings of not knowing could finally be going away. And for the first time, my heart might feel complete because it was you who reached out to me, as it should be. In any normal family. Dancing as fast as I can Still can't feel the beat Pictures move before my eyes And lull my mind to sleep Life's wonderful and I'm on top of it all I'm on top of it all And I won't look down, I won't look down Cause it feels like falling down Choices 
that I never had still weigh heavy on my mind. Some things never stay the same, and some things never change. I hide my thoughts behind this wall and live my life like I'm. You know, we need to talk, like, seriously, or I need to talk to you about something. So anyway, last year when I was in LA, I um, was on my way home and I checked my email and I got this email from this DNA testing website that uh, I had joined. You know, I searched for my biological beginnings, I guess. You know, I wanted to see, you know, where I came from. Anyway, I got an email that I had gotten my results. So I did find out, you know, my uh, background or whatever, but what we need to talk about is uh, I get an email from this guy who's like apparently my second cousin, you know, by blood or by DNA. And so this email says, I know your mother. Yeah, see we need to talk. You know, he was her cousin. Uh, his, his mother was her mother's sister. Um, yeah, he, uh, that's what happened. So I need to talk to you, you know, like in person. I mean, this is, this is crazy. So anyway, yeah. Okay? I felt nervous. This impervious feeling of resistance and insistence at the same time flooded my emotions, drowned my mind into confusion. Was this an illusion? This should have happened a long time ago. This, this is actually an intrusion into this acquired mechanism, my long accumulated definition of who I created all by myself because I would never ever allow anyone else to help. And as a result of that, I'm all fucked up.
because I've never really felt a part of anything. And as a result, I would bring all this baggage with me. Carried on my back like Sisyphus, and like him I can never be free. And it's really, really hard to find somebody selfless enough to put up with someone like me because, after all, why should they be? Senses gone way off the deep end. Give this thing one more chance. Give it one last try. See if I can win. Won't waste my time with sleeping. It only makes me dream. Dream of the life I wish for. Dream that dream. I can smile. So, she definitely had a rough life. Her mother died when she was three years old. Her father died when she was 10 years old. And she was placed in an orphanage, <laughs> which is really fucked up because, you know, I also found out that like her entire extended family all lived on Hart Street out in Brooklyn, you know, in Bed-Stuy. And so, I, you know, Nobody wanted to take in this little kid? And you know, the other weird thing is I found out that her father was actually a doctor who used to run a tuberculosis hospital out in Brooklyn back then, and actually that's how he died. He contracted TB and he died, and so, but what's weird is that she was put in the orphanage when she was six. So I, I don't know what happened with those four years. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe he was too sick to take care of her or whatever, but just, it's just weird to hear that, you know, like, she was, she was a little kid. And so then, first time I spoke to my uh, DNA cousin, you know, he described her as like, he said she was tough, you know? She was very angry and depressed, you know, she was kind of difficult. And I'm listening to this and I'm just thinking like, duh. You know, her mother died when she was three, or 
father's gone at 10, she's in an orphanage, you know, she's in this strange place with all these strange kids, you know, sleeping and eating with, with people she doesn't know. It's like in this institutionalized environment. I mean, duh. She's angry and depressed, you know, she's, she's messed up. So, yeah, it's kind of difficult to uh, hear that, you know? So anyway, she's in this orphanage, right? Like six years, like I said. You know, she didn't talk a lot. I felt like she was like labeled as angry and depressed and difficult. So I guess this was of such grave concern to, you know, the powers that be or whatever, or maybe her family, I mean, I have no idea. But then I find out that she's like moved to a psychiatric hospital. Yeah, <laughs> a mental facility, you know, like some Willowbrook Creedmoor kind of thing, which is crazy. You know what I mean? Like crazy, <laughs> literally. So she's only 12 years old now, you know, and she's in this psych hospital. And I guess she had this really traumatic experience when she was in there. She got, she got stuck in an elevator and uh, was apparently claustrophobic for the rest of her life, which is kind of odd, right? Because I'm claustrophobic. So that kind of bugged me out to hear that. So yeah, psych hospital for three years, and then it gets crazier. Because then I find out that somebody, and you know, who knows who this was? I mean, her cousin didn't know, you know, who knows, but somebody decided to move her from the psych hospital and send her to Palestine. does that to a kid like dealing with mental illness you know clearly and you know there's like a, a war going on there at that time too you know it was like right after World War II you know Nazi Germany Hitler the Holocaust and so they send this 15 year old kid to the Middle East I mean I don't know like who does that to a kid you know with a war going on and so, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's a lot. And I just, 
would really prefer to be talking to you in person about all this. I mean, can you, like, this just got dropped on me, like, all of a sudden. I mean, yeah. So now this obstruction that would cause continual destruction in my life could be removed. And finally, all of you will be completely available to believe that someone would stay with me. My self-destructive and printed doubt could finally be released and I could cease to continue to destroy everything in my life that's really important to me that I loved. Shrapnel could be cleared away and, and for the first time I would believe when someone would say, I love you. I love you. I mean, I, I would finally be equipped to stay tight-lipped and accept love, to respect space, to be able to face myself and save myself from those great mistakes that I always seem to make that you can never fucking change. I mean, now with this, I mean, with this, perhaps I can finally turn the page. But I can't turn the page. Because the truth is, you didn't really call me. For my entire lifetime, you never came to find me. I look for you, but I guess this meeting was never meant to be. And I've been falling through the cracks ever since you decided you didn't want me. You see, I just don't know how to set this free.
And I feel like I fuck up everything in my life It's really important to me, lessons never learned I do this shit incessantly and now With the pain of this latest loss I don't know, for some reason this shit's fucking killing me, yo I mean, everything in my life seems impartially Nothing completely embraces me And finally I just have to think I must do this shit to myself As much as I would love to blame you I don't even know you So, she survived. She um, made her way back to New York, like, on a ship by herself in 1951. And um, I guess shortly after she got back, she was completely estranged from her entire family, everybody. <laughs> Which, if that was her choice, kind of get that, right? You know what's crazy? What's crazy is that this DNA cousin guy of mine, he was shocked to find out about me. Like, what I'm saying is he had no idea that I existed. Like, he didn't know she had had a baby. Nobody in her entire family knew. I mean, it was. Nobody knew that I was born. I mean, how, how does that happen? You know what I mean? Like somebody in your family has a baby and nobody knows, like not one single person knew. I don't get that. It's just, I mean, it's just weird, right? Her name was Judith, by the way. Judith Zeta Seidenberg. Judith. But I guess everybody called her Judy. Need to get out of here for a minute. Oh, 
White's like a meal in the barnyard Just like a meal in the barnyard I can't be his farmer I've got no more grain I've got no more grain Okay, so paid notice, deaths, Seidenberg, Judy, April 11th, 2003. A woman of great kindness whose friendship was dear to all she knew. A poet, a fitness guru, and a lover of life. Beloved office manager of 18 years for Dr. Jonathan Z. Charney, your wisdom, spirit, and generosity will be sorely missed. Funeral services will be held April 11th at 10 a.m. Adat Israel, 201 East Broadway, New York City. Contributions.
so that was the New York Times obituary obviously Judith's obituary and it was written by the doctor she worked for Dr. Charney and the thing is she's still alive So I called him. Turns out she's like this beloved character, you know, like not angry or depressed. And, you know, and it didn't seem like she was all that difficult, you know, like the way she was described at the beginning of her life. She was, she was cool, you know, and apparently she was like this real character too. Like, like Dr. Charney told me this story about how, you know, she was the office manager. So when people were in the waiting room, when Charney called him back to come see him, Judy, you know, they called her Judy. She wouldn't let him go back into Charney's office until the patient would feel Judy's abs. You know? Fitness guru. Crazy. I guess she was homeless. She, um, she didn't just work in the office, she slept there. Dr. Charney told me she had like issues, you know, like he actually said to me she was like kind of like 20 in her head, even though she was like 65, 70 years old. I mean, but she seemed to be cool. Dr. Charney actually got her a lifetime membership at the New York Health and Racquet Club down by Columbus Circle, you know, down at 59th Street. So she would have a place to shower. But apparently she took advantage of the membership too because she like, I guess she would be down there all the time and she swam five days a week and it turns out that she became really good friends with, with Jerry Stiller, <laughs> you know, the, the comedian, Stiller and Mira, you know, like, and, and she became friends with Leonard Bernstein, like she was probably, probably thought she was like the crazy lady from 89th Street, you know, like where, where the office was. So, you know, eventually I go down and I meet Dr. Charney in person. And when I got there, I, uh, I met this doorman who seemed like he was, you know, old enough to know who Judith was at that time. You know, maybe he knew her. So I asked him, you know, I was like, did you know Judith Seidenberg? And he looked at me and he was like, Judy? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Judy, yeah. He's like, why? Like he was defensive or something, you know, and I was like, well, she's, she was actually my, um, my biological mother, like I, and he's like, Judy had a son? I <laughs> like, was, was just shocked, just completely floored, but anyway, he told me this, this great story about her, he's like, he told me that every morning, she would get up and she would walk all the way down to the village, like, you know, five miles, and she would buy all this silver jewelry, like cheap jewelry, you know, you know, nothing expensive, she didn't have any money or anything like that. But she'd buy this jewelry and then she'd walk all the way back uptown and apparently she would gift all of that jewelry to him and all the other doormen and like all the porters in the building too. And in all the surrounding buildings, you know, like, I guess she was friends with everybody and everybody loved her, but he told me he didn't come to work one day for 18 years where he didn't get a gift of the jewelry from her. So but then he said to me, you know, Judy's dead, right? And I was like, yeah, I do. He goes, you know how she died? I said, actually, no. And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, I'll let Dr. Chani tell you, but I saw it. So that was kind of weird. But anyway, I went up to see Dr. Charney, and so I was sitting across this big desk from him and 
I walked in his office, you know, we had already spoken on the phone. But he just looked at me and he says to me, okay. So let me just tell you what happened. So anyway, Dr. Charney says to me, your mother, actually, he kind of talked like my mother, of, well, you know, not my, not my birth mother. I don't know what she sounded like or anything, but anyway, he says to me, your mother bought a rose, a single rose from a bodega over on uh, Lexington Avenue and 88th Street to bring to a friend Hilda for her birthday, who uh, I guess worked at another doctor's office around the corner on Park Avenue. And so she was bringing her a rose for her birthday. And so when she got back around to Park Avenue, about to walk into their building, she was hit by a van, hit and run. Um, I guess they caught the guy, you know, he was a kid. The car wasn't even registered or anything like that. But anyway, she um, got hit by this van and Charney said it was terrible. You know, like he heard it from his office, you know, crazy commotion, people yelling and screaming, sirens, you know, the street was just crazy. So he ran out to see what was going on. Saw her laying on the street, but she was still alive. So he went with her in the ambulance to New York Hospital. And when they got there, the uh, emergency room doctor said to him, look, this woman needs uh, open heart surgery to survive, but I'm not sure if it's even worth doing the surgery. You know, she's been like pancake. I mean, the trauma, I don't know if she would ever recover. So anyway, we need to speak to her family. And Charney was like, there is no family. And so then he says to me, you know, every time I ask Judy, Judy, you know, he called it Judy. Every time I asked Judy about her family, she would tell me they're all dead. And I'd be like, what do you mean they're all dead? Like, how's that even possible? Like, what, they all die the plague? But she just kept insisting that they were all dead, you know, and in my opinion, I would say they were dead to her, you know, given everything that I found out. But you know, I'd, I don't know, maybe that's not fair. I don't want to be judgmental or anything, but anyway, Charney said, you know what? If anybody could recover from this, it would be Judy. Do the surgery. And so they did it. And uh, unfortunately, she died right there on the table. But what's really amazing is that Charney said to me, she was still clutching that rose. He says, God's honest truth. I couldn't believe it, but she was still holding the rose. I couldn't get it out of her hand. You know, maybe she had rigor mortis or something like that. I don't know. Thorn actually punctured her skin, you know, between her thumb and her forefinger. And he said, he remember this small little trickle of blood? And he says to me, I look down at her and she's gone, you know. Just, and I thought to myself, you know what? That's Judy. Bloody fist in a rose and somebody who would never let go never give up. That's Judy. Anyway, 
Dr. Charney buried her in the cemetery where he buried his old parents out in Long Island. And he actually sat Shiva for her too, which is amazing. I mean, it's not even his real family, you know? He sat Shiva for her and he actually told me that the week that he shut down his office, almost every patient who met her over the 18 years that she worked for him came to pay their respects during that week. And he says to me, you really should know that she was really loved by a lot of people. Like, really, really loved. And I don't know that. You know, I didn't know her or whatever. It just makes me feel good to hear that, you know? I mean, yeah, so that's what happened. Since you were my vessel, perhaps I should thank you. But I have to admit, be it secretly and sometimes embarrassingly, sometimes I just wish that you had aborted me. Dark thoughts pervade my insides. I mean, I feel as if I've died like a million times. How did you find it so easy to release me? Then I stopped 
amputated yourself from me completely. Just cut me off. Turn me into this referred history. Did you feel anything when you were disconnected from me? Were you curious at all or am I just some kind of discarded, disposable fate of memory? You know, I did live inside you for nine months and you did birth me. Then you made this big fucking decision all by yourself to let it go to give me away and you never even told my father about me. I was this bloody wet little baby. No. I was your bloody wet little baby. And you never even took the time to get to know me. Thank you. So you know she named me, right? Yeah, like I had a different name. David. David Seidenberg. <laughs> I mean, that freaks me out. You know, I had a different name. Did you know that? Like, they're just, it just makes me wonder, you know, my middle name, David. I mean, I don't know. Just crazy to me that I had a different name before I met you, before you knew me. Yeah. Just makes me wonder. So anyway, I did search for her. You know, like, I went to the agency, you know, to Louise Wise, you know, just looking for basic information, you know, like, but before I could even ask for anything, this social worker that I met, she says to me, before you even begin, let me just tell you, you know, if your mother ever really, really wanted to meet you, like if she ever really wanted to find you, she would have done so by now. So, you know, if you're thinking about it, just let it go. I mean, everybody eventually comes in here, you know, looking for their mother or their children or whatever. I mean, believe me, you're not so special. It's better for both of you, believe me. Let it go. Move on with your life. <laughs> I mean, unsolicited, okay? So like, I didn't even ask where she was, or if she was even still alive. Like, I, I didn't even ask any of that stuff. So it was just kind of weird to hear that, you know? Like, why did she say that to me? But here's the kicker. She says to me, your mother left a handwritten note telling us that if you ever came around looking for her, that we would just tell you to just go away, you know? She said, you know, told me that apparently my biological mother had like absolutely no interest in meeting me if I ever came around looking for her. I mean, I, you know, it's not that it was a big deal or anything to me, but you know, 
I didn't ask for the note, you know, I didn't get to see it or anything, but yeah, apparently she left a note saying she didn't want to meet me, she didn't want to know me, nothing. That's what I was told. Yeah. But guess what? When I met Dr. Charney, he told me, well, actually, there's a woman who works in his office now who also was working back then when Charney, you know, she knew my biological mother. And so this woman said to me when she first met me, which was like before I had even said a word to her, she said to me, she looked for you. It's like, what are you talking about? She goes, your mother looked for you. She just couldn't find you, but she never stopped looking. It's like, what are you talking about? And she said, she went to the agency that you came from trying to see if they would help her with some information to, to find you. And they told her that you had left a note, a handwritten note, saying that you had no interest in meeting her, that they were just t to tell her to go away. So, they told Judith Same thing that they told me. I mean, why would they do something like that? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's messed up. You know, like I just, I don't understand. I mean, so, you know, I, I would, I, you see why I need to be talking to you about this? Like I need to talk to you in person. You know, this is all crazy. Like, this is insanity to suddenly, you know, get all this information. I want to talk to you. You know, I desire to talk to you in person. You know what? I know it's ridiculous and probably, probably impossible, but I know I need more than this. You know, like we should have talked about this a long time ago, face to face. I just, you know, I know I need to be in the same space with you to deal with some of this. We need to talk. There's a hole at the bottom of this cup. I want to fix it so I can fill it up and there is sand where the flowers used to be. I was happy then, and you were here with me. I'm feeling kind of fragile lately. I know only I can save me now. I'm not hoping there's no use praying. I know.
So how you guys doing? Anyway. I think I'm just gonna go home now. Yeah. Simply miserable. Tell me what the hell are you scared of when in the end the only thing is love in the end? Love's the only thing. I want to regret the things wanna, I've done. Wanna, Never wanna, the things I've left wanna, unknown. Wanna, Never wanna, a second will I waste. Never an opportunity wanna, to taste wanna, the sweetness of wanna, this life. Wanna, All of the misery wanna, and strife. All of the challenges I fight. Love is hope for all, love it conquers all, whether big or small, love never, love never, love is hope for all, love it conquers all, whether big or small, love never fails, oh, love never, love it conquers all, love never You know, I happen to think everybody should be able to have access to, uh, you know, the information about where they came from and who they came from. Like, I think that should be a given. You know, like, I don't think anybody 
should have to like fight or struggle for that kind of information. You know, I think that I think it's fundamental to who you are, and so I just think everyone, regardless of their circumstance, should have the right to know about that if that's what they want. But obviously, you know, if you're adopted, you don't have that kind of information. You know, it's kept from you. You're not allowed to know, you know, by law. And I just think that that's messed up. Yeah. I mean, imagine not knowing, okay? I mean, maybe that's hard for you to do, but just try to imagine for a second, like not knowing about you, right? Like not being allowed to know about you. You know, like, like you are connected to all of this stuff, like all of these people and, and, and all this history, like biologically, you know, through DNA, like, like through blood, you're connected and yet you're not allowed to have access to that information. Can you imagine what that might feel like? Because it ain't good. It's not. I mean, and what's the point? You know, like, I don't even understand the point. You know, just because I'm adopted, you know, I, I can't know about me. You know, and who, who else gets treated this way, right? Like for just wanting to know about yourself. You know, like, like, like just because I want to know about my biological beginnings, I'm considered selfish or, you know, disrespectful towards you. You know, inconsiderate, like it's got nothing to do with you. You know, it's mine, this is my life. You know, like my background. Before I even knew you. I mean, and it's, you know what, it's not even, it's not even so much about the specific information. It's really more about like not being allowed to know. You know, it just makes me feel like, like, my life has this big kind of compartmentalized part to it, you know, that's like this deep, dark secret, you know, it makes me feel like, like a secret, you know what I mean? And no, nobody likes to feel like a secret, you know what I'm saying? So it's just weird, you know, it's like, is it, is it really that horrific? That's what I've walked around feeling like, is it that horrible? Like this information that's sealed, you know, by law, you know, like in, is it, is it that terrible? Like what happened? <laughs> you know, like, it just, it feels weird. It's not right, you know? And by the way, you know, there've been, there've been a lot of things in my life that have not, you know, turned out the way, you know, maybe I would have wished, you know, relationships, especially. And I actually think that this, this, you know, like kind of imprinted feeling of disconnect in my life, you know, had a lot to do with my behavior in many, many circumstances. You know, like I could have been better, <laughs> for sure. Things could have been better. I mean, I just, you know, I've always kind of felt like maybe this, this not knowing affected me in a way that, you know, made it hard for me to, to stay connected, you know, to feel comfortable, connected to, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, maybe not, I don't know, but that's the whole point, I don't know. And, you know, I should be allowed to know. This unknown thing is like really kind of, kind of deep, you know, it's kind of rough. And, you know, what are you trying to protect me? Like, I thought about that my whole life, even when I was a kid, you know, like you're trying to protect me. I don't need to be protected from information about me. You know, that's mine. 
that I own. You know, like all these other people know all this stuff about me that I don't even know. You know what I mean? Like they don't even know me, but they know about me. And I'm not allowed to know, you know? <laughs> you know, you need to protect me, you know, if you knew stuff. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not that little foster child, you know, that little adopted baby anymore. You know, I'm a grown man. You know, I've been grown for a long time. I am not that little baby. So if you knew, you could have told me, you know. I mean, my whole point is I should be able to know about me. You know, the first time I saw a picture of her, of Judith, you know, my biological mother, you know what I thought? I thought, oh, hell no. Like, that is not my mother. Like, honestly, I thought she was ugly. Which, is like a weird, twisted kind of thing because, you know, she looks like me or I look like her or whatever, but yeah, I thought she was ugly. And so, you know, like, the thing is that, you see, I, I didn't think I knew what my biological mother looked like. Like, I knew what she looked like, like in here, in my head, I knew what this person looked like, like where I came from, <laughs> you know? I mean, so I guess when I saw this picture of Judith, it was like so jarring that I just, I didn't receive it very well, you know? And so, you know, like, I thought about that, like, where did I get this picture from? You know, like, did I just make this up, you know, out of, out of nothing or, you know, like, and then I realized, you know, and I really, really thought about it is that this picture that was living in my head for like my whole life, you know, basically for as long as I can remember, this picture was based on a real tangible picture, like a photograph that I have. I mean, I, I still have it now. It's based on this picture of you. You know, before you knew daddy, before you knew any of us, you know, you were like a teenager, maybe early 20s or something like that. You were at a, a dance or some kind of function or something like that. And you were looking right into the camera like you knew your picture was being taken, you know, looking like trouble. <laughs> You know, looking, looking really beautiful. I mean, you were, you were beautiful, you know? And so, I don't know, it was just this really cool vibe, you know, all these cool people around you. Was, everybody was dressed to the nines, you know, it was, 
So that, you know, to me, that is where I came from, I guess. You know, I put that in my head. I mean, I didn't do it on purpose or anything like that, but I don't know. You know, somehow I made, you know, you, my adoptive mother, my biological mother. Which, you know, is kind of weird when you think about it. I mean, that's what I did. So that's why when I saw this picture of Judith, it just didn't compute, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, no, I rejected it. just makes me think, you know. Or I guess what I want to tell you I can't talk to you out there. I mean, I don't even believe you're still there. You know, like I don't, I don't believe in that kind of stuff, you know? And I mean, if there is a spiritual realm um, where I can communicate with you, I guess, you know, for me, feels more real when I look at your picture because at least I can see you. But I don't believe, you know, believe your decomposed bodies are in there maybe, but, but you know, I have to admit, you know, I come here a lot, you know, I come here and I do, I do feel you, you know, like, it almost feels like, you know, these ghosts are floating above all these stones, you know, all these souls. So I guess I do kind of believe something, but I'm not really sure what it is that I believe in. You know, who knows what's real and I don't know. You know. It's like I've had this hole in the middle of my chest from my whole life, you know, like right here. Like this empty space, you know, or empty, emptiness, you know, of the unknown, you know, what I didn't know, you know, what I wasn't allowed to know. And so, you know, like, who wants to feel empty all the time, right? So I filled it up. You know, being who I am, I uh, created stories. You know, like who my mother was, my father, like, you know, I mean, I, I did search, you know, I did go to Louise Wise and, you know, apparently I was lied to. I mean, this whole, this whole secrecy thing is so weird and, and and destructive in so many ways, you know, it's like, it's not a good thing. But anyway, I created a story, you know, and actually a, a beautiful story, you know, an amazing story. You know, and it was mine. 
you know, like it was me. Um, nobody could tell me anything. Like I, I created this story and I owned it, and uh, and I actually, I guess, I believed it after a while, <laughs> you know. Um, on some level, why not, you know? I mean, but the thing is, you know, now this this whole narrative thing that I created, this life, you know, this um, this amazing story is no longer true. I mean, not only is it not true, but it's absolutely incorrect, you know, like, because because now it's filled up with facts, you know, like this, this real, actual, tangible human being that, you know, I don't even know, <laughs> you know, like, and who doesn't know anything about me? Like, it's like this thing that was in me so deep, like embedded in my soul, you know, like it, you know, it, it, it is me, you know what I mean? Or it was me. It's not that anymore. And so, what am I supposed to do with that now? You know? I mean, I guess I just gotta get used to it. You know, when I got, when I got that information from uh, that DNA test a year ago, I really, I needed to talk to somebody. You know? And actually I needed to talk to you, you know, both of you. Because I did have questions, like it brought up a lot of stuff, you know, like, and you were the only two people who could answer these questions. So it was really frustrating for me, you know, like I got this, I got this information, but I couldn't talk about it with you or with this Judith person. And so, yeah, I met people that knew her. I learned about her, but that's not what this is about for me. You know, that's not what, what really, you know, got me all turned upside down, you know. But one thing I really felt was that I, I just, I had to talk to you. You know, there were things that I just really needed you to know, you know? I needed to tell you. And so, you know, even though, like I said, I don't really believe that you're here, but I do feel you, so that's weird and, uh, You know, I came here and it took me a while to come here because I guess I feel kind of like guilty that I never talked about it before or I don't know if guilty is the right word, like, but it's not good, it's bad. And so I came here to tell you. that, you know, if you did know about any of this stuff, even if you didn't tell me, I just wanted to come up here and tell you that I know that you did the best that you could. You know, like, I think that, you know, I believe that you did the best you could and, and, and I do believe that you love me. I mean, you gave me a home. And I felt safe. But what I really came here to tell you 
and what I really need to tell you. that if you told me I mean if you knew and if you did tell me you know I wonder like I've walked around with this feeling my whole life wondering if you kept all these secrets from me about who my mother was and where I came from or who my biological mother was But I wondered if you didn't tell me because, because, because maybe you were afraid that if you told me that I, that if you told me that I wouldn't love you. Because I know that I didn't tell you that I loved you really at all. I know I was a hard kid, you know, like I was difficult. I know that I shut you out a lot, you know. I kept a lot of things to myself, but I felt like you were keeping everything from me. <laughs> and I didn't really feel connected to anybody, you know, or anything. But I did know that you loved me. And I just hope that you knew that I loved you too. And that if you did, if you did know and if you had told me that I still would have loved you, you know, like it wouldn't have mattered. loved you guys, you know, I feel really grateful, but I also feel really sad because, you know, everything could have been so much better. But I guess at the end of the day, you know, that's life, you know. We all just do the best we can, you know. There are so many things in my life that I know that I could have done better. We all have those things, I believe. And so, That's it. I hope you knew. And I hope you weren't afraid because there was nothing you could have told me that would have changed the way I felt about you or how I loved you. Nothing. Still could have told me if you knew. Where have the days all gone to? 
haven't done half the things we want to. Oh well, we'll catch up some other time. All right, I'll talk to your stones. See you guys later. Seems not 
to tremble You make a rift inside me Every day That you choose to stay I walk the edge and Push it wider You are forgiven I open all my doors You are forgiven is for I am no martyr you give me reason I try harder and wait for a warmer season meanwhile you are forgiven Soft noise like a sigh, a singing like a lullaby. It is my heart, it is this wind that blows through where you held me closer. And I guess we had quite a bit in common, too. It's pretty amazing, right? So, I brought you this because I know you were holding on to one of these to the very end. Should take it out of this thing, right? Thank you. 
Your feet so tight you can hardly walk. Sometimes it's an effort to even talk. Your arms so heavy. I've come to learn as time ticks on that it is now the only thing that counts. What was or is to be a passé and presumption. One must concentrate on now to survive each day. There's a fighter in the likes of you. And no matter how difficult, you'll see it through. You'll see it through. This is Judy. It's October 11th, 2002 and 3.04 a.m. I'm in Dr. Choni's office at home. Thank you.